Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Very busy show for us. It's Jake Fromm live on the air today uh, before we're done. Connor Riley to react as well to everything happening around Georgia football here right now. Dogs get a massive commitment yesterday from five-star linebacker. We'll celebrate that on our show and talk about what might be next. And off the top of the program, One of, I believe, Georgia's most important players for this upcoming season is seeing a little bit of a narrative shift around him. What was once said about him, I think, is no longer true. We'll talk about why that is and what it means. Busy times. Glad to have you with us for it. What do you say? We dive into it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Dial 678-ESOG now for a solution to your foundation and waterproofing problems. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. Coming up in a couple of minutes, you know we have plenty today on five-star linebacker Justin Williams committing to Georgia yesterday. We are all over that here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia today. Prior to that, There is something that was once said a lot about a Georgia football player that I don't think can be said any longer. I'm talking about Ladd McConkie. McConkie obviously is a very interesting story on this Georgia team from the standpoint there were a lot of people, and I guess admittedly probably me, although I don't love saying this, uh, admittedly probably me as well, who just wasn't quite so sure when McConkie first came into this Georgia program that he had a chance, forget the idea that he might you know, play a starring role in a Georgia team sometime in the future, but the fact that he had a chance to even be a contributing player to Georgia, just at first blush, at first glance, I don't know that McConkie gave off that vibe to me. He seemed a little too small. You weren't really quite sure of the background, kind of where he came from in terms of the high school you know, program he's a part of or, or just the overall story, the overall package, just did not quite feel like this is a guy that's going to one day be, uh, you know, a wide receiver can even play at Georgia, much less one of the very top players in the league. But at this point in time, I think you have to suggest and you have to kind of point out that that narrative obviously has been kind of confounded here a little bit because of how well Land McConkey played. McConkey was one of Georgia's best receivers a year ago, had almost 800 yards receiving, and showed up big and played very well in very important games. Had Georgia's first touchdown of the year last year on the uh, rushing play there in the Oregon game. This is a guy who sort of exploded on the scene. And at that point in time, you would have to say that no matter what we thought about McConkey when he was coming into the program or whatever kind of expectation we had from McConkie while he was here the fact of the matter is that is all water under the bridge that is all old and over and done and Lamb McConkie's become a very good player and the slow way in which the realization of that kind of takes place would lead some people to believe that well Lamb McConkie is all you know is, is underrated right it's like it's like people sort of think he's one thing he's actually another and it's that a sort of age-old adage of you know who's the under underrated player who are the guys that are being overlooked or who are the guys and this is the phrase that you often hear a lot is who are the guys who are being slept on and in fact you know pro football focus the other day kind of sort of put this out there because obviously they're you know, putting out all their preseason content the same way everybody else is. And, you know, they were also kind of furthering what has been the prevailing narrative around Ladd McConkey that a good player that no one had expected is now better than people realize. And I'll show you this tweet on the screen from Pro Football Focus. Uh, Trevor Sikama, one of their people, says that Ladd McConkey, he believes, could be a thousand yard receiver here this year. Um, or even a thousand yard receiver at the NFL level, uh, Trevor Sycamus says about Ladd McConkey and the caption on the particular tweet from Pro Football Focus or whatever it is we're calling Twitter these days says, Don't sleep on Ladd McConkey. That's Pro Football Focus kind of furthering the narrative here that Ladd McConkey has been an underrated player. Now, here's the point that I want to get to. It is probably true that McConkey has been underrated, certainly for all of 2022, that I don't know that people fully realize that McConkey was one of the best receivers in the entire SEC. But y'all, I don't think that we can now say that Ladd McConkey is underrated anymore. As we talked about yesterday, Ladd McConkey was one of 11 Georgia players who got a preseason first team all SEC not. Now, ultimately, the preseason first team all SEC is a little more than just a prediction of how the season is actually going to play out. It's what happens at the end of the year that matters more. 
But nonetheless, when you see McConkey kind of mentioned there as one of the top small handful of top returning receivers in the SEC, this is no longer a guy being slept on. And this is no longer a guy that's in the underrated category. This is now, I think, rightly viewed to be, or at least someone who should rightly view, be viewed to be, a known commodity on the Georgia roster and a player that very, you know, rightly so, as pro football focus suggests, could be ready to take that next step towards being a truly dominant force, the kind of guy that could get a 1,000 yards for Georgia here this season, and the kind of guy that could be very much on NFL draft radars next year. Despite his size, despite everything else, at this point in time, Ladd McConkey isn't being slept on. He isn't underrated. He is rightly viewed as one of the best wide receivers in the SEC. He was a first-team preseason all-conference nod just last week in Nashville. Now, that doesn't make it an unremarkable story. It is remarkable that Ladd came from where he came from with very little in the way of accolades to produce this level of, I guess, you know, fame that he's achieved now. But nonetheless, this is where he is. This is the new narrative around Ladd McConkey. This isn't underrated, overlooked, or slept on. This is one of the best receivers in the SEC who Mike Bobo, as an offensive coordinator this year, is going to be trying to utilize his weaponry and his skill set in as many ways possible. And the idea of a guy who knocked on the door of 800 yards receiving a year ago can take that to a next level here this year where quite possibly he could be, along with maybe Brock Bowers, a guy chasing 1,000 yards for Georgia here this year, fully unlocking the potential that exists for this Georgia offense. Now, to go back in time here for a moment, how is it that this, to use a fancier word than I should probably use, metamorphosis occur? How did McConkey kind of go from being a player that sort of got added late to a Georgia class that few people thought much about, at least admittedly probably me, didn't think all that much about, to now being a guy that's a preseason, first-team All-SEC? Well, while that transformation was occurring last year, Kirby Smart talked about that during the season, the confidence that McConkey developed, the belief in himself to kind of go out and achieve at the levels that he's currently achieving. It is a great story, but it's a story now that we're getting more used to, more acquainted with. This is what Kirby said about Ladd McConkey last year. Probably confidence. Ladd's always been a good player. Um, that's not something new. He's always been an extremely hard worker. He's dependable. He's conscientious. It's important to him. He gives you everything he's got every day. And uh, the, the biggest difference is, you know, he has confidence in himself to perform because he performed on big stages last year. And when you're one of these guys that has confidence, talent, and you work really hard, then the sky's the limit for you. And he's, he's worked really hard each and every, every day. And he knows the things he's still got to work on, and he's got a lot of those things too. And I'm sure moving into the 2023 season, Kirby Smart would probably say the same thing. There's even still more that McConkey can do to learn and grow and be even a better version of himself here this season than he was a year ago. But this is kind of the point that I'm building to on this. You know, we're going to talk to Connor Riley here in a, a couple of moments, and Connor's got an interesting story up at DogNation.com today where he talks about the overall potential for the Georgia offense, the fact that it could be even better here this season than – Maybe, you know, we kind of believe it is, or maybe this first team all SEC stuff that we saw last week suggests because there are guys like, you know, Carson Beck and Dominic Lovett that, based on the sort of procedural rules of the SEC, weren't even eligible to be voted on. And I do think that creates kind of an exciting scenario for dog fans where you look at now known commodity in Brock Bowers, known commodity in Ladd McConkey. If you're a preseason first team all SEC at that point in time, you are a known commodity for the people who kind of follow this league the closest. And, and understand this league the best. And as we've kind of pointed out before, when you have a big breakthrough with multiple pass catchers, when you don't just have the leading receiver who has 1,000 yards, something we expect Brock Bowers to have this year, but when your number two receiver is also knocking on the door of the same kind of achievement, it seems like that kind of unlocks something with your offense, that all of a sudden the floodgates open and you also produce 1,000-yard rusher there as well, and you start scoring well in excess of 40 points per game there as well. There's something about creating two pass-catching weapons that seems to unlock everything for an offense. We've seen that in recent years in the SEC. You want to go back to you know, Bama in 2020 or LSU in 2019 or you know, other examples you want to cite there, is that when you kind of find that second pass catcher who really breaks through with the degree in which that McConkey might break through this year, it's the kind of thing that unlocks all the potential for an offense. And I think you have to at least consider that as a possibility for Georgia here this year. I told you on the show yesterday. There are only a handful of possible outcomes for Georgia, knowing that the national championship and the go for three and 23 is the ultimate goal for this team. One of those possibilities is Georgia just wins this thing with ease, just marches through the next 15 games with little in the way of any kind of challenge whatsoever. 
when you think about a role that a guy like Ladd McConkey could play going along with a Brock Bowers, who is Georgia's sort of other big-time known commodity right now, when you think about the way in which Georgia could unlock all of its offensive potential if these guys play up to their sort of top-line expectation, you understand the path for how Georgia gets there. And at the very least, it makes the transition to a brand-new starting quarterback that much easier because eventually we're going to get a lot into the rest of the summer prior to the start of the season in September about kind of what is out there for the Georgia quarterback spot. And if we assume that for now Carson Beck is in the lead and likely to become the starter, how does he grow into that role? Well, having this kind of talent around him is the sort of thing that a lot of Georgia starting quarterbacks to begin their careers could not say they had going for him. Uh, But Carson Beck, if he is the starter, he will have a lot of weapons at his disposal. And watching how all of this comes together, watching how all of this plays out, including a guy in Land McConkey who's finally getting the attention and the credit he deserves for Georgia fans, Watching that could be indeed a very fun thing. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented today by Engineered Solutions of Georgia, and we're happy to have you with us. No matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. Also, if you watch on our own platform at dognation.com or the Dog Nation app, we'll start even earlier for you at 9.45. We'll give you a little extra content, of course, free of charge, as we always do, because that's probably what it's worth but nonetheless uh 9 45 we'll do our first and 15 there for you dognation.com dog nation app interacting taking your comments having some fun that's what we love doing here around here and of course you listen to us on the radio at noon on app and sports radio 96 the ref podcast apple spotify world famous dognation.com everything else in between whichever way you choose to access the show we're just glad you do it big thanks to our friends as well at engineered solutions of georgia who make it all possible for you there as well foundation waterproofing problems those can be two of the most significant issues you can face as a homeowner and if you find yourself with the evidence of that we had huge storms last week rain coming uh down heavily and mightily and you see evidence of that where it's not supposed to be i'm talking about the water that creeps in garage those wet spots in the floor residue that lets you know water's been there before uh you know in the in the basement the crawl space all of that can be evidence of a problem and a signal to you that ba reminded you to make sure you pick up the phone and call our friends at engineered solutions of georgia to help you with all of that same thing for those cracks in the wall uh you see the horizontal cracks in the wall or the stair step cracks your brick something along those lines once again that's a signal to you that something could be not quite right and something definitely needs to be seen about and engineered solutions of georgia is the uh, service you want to trust to handle any of these kinds of issues for you because they have got an entire team of engineers on staff. And there's really nobody else in our marketplace that can put that level of resource to work for you to help you solve your problem. After all, Engineered Solutions of Georgia is a solutions-based company. The word solution is right there in their name. That means if it's a simple fix, they'll tell you all you need to know about that. If it's a more substantial problem, all the more reason to have smart folks doing the great work for you. Now, here's the other cool thing there as well. ESOG is a proud partner of UGA. As I've said before, it's always fun to support those that support the dogs, and they've been longtime friends of ours here at Dog Nation Daily there as well, which is certainly something I'm very grateful for. Grateful to them for what they've done for us and grateful to all of you who've shown your support to Engineered Solutions of Georgia because of their continued partnership with us. I truly appreciate that. When you reach out to them, make sure you tell them that BA uh, sent you there. Here's another cool thing there as well. They're going to offer you a fully transferable triple protection warranty on materials, installation, and design. So it's time for you to pick up the phone and give them a call. Very easy number to remember. 678-ESOG-NOW. That's 678-ESOG-NOW. Don't forget, Engineered Solutions of Georgia, proud partners of UGA, big-time friends of ours here on Dog Nation Daily. So make sure you reach out to them here today. All right, so we have a very uh, busy and full show coming up for you. Before we are done today, we're going to get a chance to catch up with former Georgia quarterback Jake Fromm. Jake joins us, of course, every week. Uh, A lot of times during the week, because of NFL training camps and things like that, Jake is kind of forced to pre-record. We kind of air it the next day. We actually get the uh, good fortune of joining Jake today as a part of our live recording of this show. So we'll do that coming up before we're all all said and done. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. An SEC network analyst has said something pretty wild uh, about a player in this league that I don't think the Georgia fans are going to love very much. We'll talk about that here coming up in just a minute there too. But prior to that, let's go around the doghouse here today and talk about big news that we were on video for last night as five-star linebacker Justin Williams made his commitment announcement for Georgia. I'll show you some of the official particulars on the screen here. You're talking about you know a guy that 
you know, basically the number one linebacker in the country, number 13 overall player, obviously a high school teammate there at Oak Ridge in Texas. It's uh, Conroe, Texas, the Oak Ridge High School program with another Georgia commit, Joseph Joan Ajanye. This is about as good a pair of teammates, I guess, as Georgia's ever pulled here. Now, a lot of y'all know I'd like Justin Williams no matter what, but when you see in that particular photo there, him showing off the uh, Georgia-themed wrestling-style championship belt, that's a pretty good way to have me at hello there as well. A great combination of two of my favorite things with the pro wrestling and the Georgia football. And obviously, this is just one of those massive recruiting wins that I think tells you a lot about the current state of Georgia recruiting. And, you know, yesterday on the show, we talked a lot about the role that Glenn Schumann plays in a situation like this. Uh, Connor Riley and I will talk more about that here coming up in just a moment. But, you know, given the idea that Georgia very likely could lose a guy like Demarcus Riddick this week, there's been some expectation that might go down. Uh, To be able to kind of sort of as a prelude to all of that, bring in a linebacker of the caliber of Justin Williams, it just sort of shows you that no matter what kind of chatter other programs seem to develop and what kind of, you know, conversation seems to exist around, you know, other programs right now, Georgia's recruiting apparatus seems to be functioning without really much in the way of a very serious rival here right now. They are just collecting big-time talent by the bushel. And we saw the run a few days ago with like four four four-star offensive linemen over the course of a nine-day span. Joseph Jonah Johnny was kind of in the midst of that same period of time. We kind of wondered out loud, okay, well, is Georgia now about to start knocking it down on defense at the same way? And I think we've got some evidence that is indeed the case. And obviously for Georgia fans, the the big question that gets asked on the heels of a commitment like Justin Williams is, and you can say this out loud yourself, is, okay, well, what's next? Who's next? Who's going to follow in Williams' footsteps here? And so last night when we were live on video, I had a chance to pose that to our Dog Nation recruiting insider, Jeff Sintel, fresh off of vacation. Jeff will be back with us on the show again this week and back on his own show before the Hedge is presented by Kroger tomorrow night. But I asked Jeff, okay, so is this a signal? If Joseph Jonah Johnye, who essentially called his shot with Justin Williams, does this tell you good things about Williams Winery, who at least according to some services is the current number one prospect? Does this tell you anything about K.J. Bolden coming up on August 5th? Does this tell you anything about even more emerging momentum for this 2024 class for Georgia on defense? Jeff Sintel talked about that last night live on the Dog Nation video channels. This is what our recruiting insider had to say. The number one defensive lineman would be Williams Winery. The number one safety in the country would be K.J. Bolden. You see the what the dogs are doing here. And, you know, you start adding a couple more names to this class, and the class might even be done by August 10th. August 15th, August 20th, and folks are going to go, what's going on now? Is everyone going to get revved up about the 2025 recruiting class? Are they going to, they're going to, they're going to sit there and they're going to go, okay, what happens with Demarcus Riddick on the 26th? And what does that mean for Christopher Jones? What does that mean for Chris Cole? I think those are maybe some, you know, missing pieces of the 2024 recruiting class. We mentioned Nate Frazier, uh, the running back, but I, I keep doing, I keep saying this is uh, you, you step back for a second and you say, this is good for any program, but now this is even like rarefied air for the Georgia football recruiting machine right now, what they keep adding. So that is Jeff Sintel, and you love that phrase at the end, rarefied air for the Georgia recruiting machine. And I think maintaining the proper perspective with all of this is always really very important because, let's face it, we've gotten very used to seeing Georgia win big-time recruiting battles, so much so that – they kind of bleed into each other a little bit, but every now and then it's appropriate to just sort of pause and reflect. You know, last night, Georgia, as seemingly effortlessly as, you know, it orders takeout, you know, picked up a number one linebacker in the country, top 13 overall player in the country, and it really stands as a great signal of the of the dominance that Georgia's putting out there. I don't know how it's going to play out with williams Winery. Obviously, I think you take the – the pursuit of Missouri and Oklahoma pretty seriously here, maybe Oklahoma more so than anything else. Uh, I, I think I think you take that pretty seriously right now. But for Georgia, who has proven so adept to getting so many big-time players, I think you have to also take the dogs pretty seriously there as well. Jeff mentions a pair of uh, linebackers out of the state of uh, Virginia, Chris Cole and uh, 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 Christopher Jones. They're on that. Those are guys that you're also watching too, and – I guess if you think about the other side of the ball, there's still a lot of excitement out there about what Nate Frazier, the uh, running back from California, might do. The overall point here, though, is this is a special time for Georgia recruiting. They are moving at a pace 
<laughs> unlike anything we've seen before. Not only are they you know, moving towards the number one overall class, perhaps a historic class in the annals of Georgia football history and you know, perhaps recent college football history there as well, they're doing it with blazing speed to the point where they may be done here coming up in just a, a little bit, and yet uh, big-time names still likely to be added there as well. Fun times for these dogs, an exciting thing to see for sure as Georgia adds a five-star linebacker last night to this class in the person of Justin Williams. We'll make that around the doghouse for you here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Let me also give a quick shout-out here to something that's really fun going on at Dog Nation here right now. You've heard me talk about this before. Hopefully you've taken time to participate. If you have it, you still have time to do so. We are celebrating outstanding teachers right now on Dog Nation Daily, courtesy of our friends at Kroger, and we're inviting you to help us do that. If you go to dognation.com, you'll see a link, very easy to find, right there at the top of the page, where you can nominate an outstanding teacher you know. This can be your child's teacher. This can be a teacher you have in your family. This can be a teacher that just exists in your community. Just someone you know who's doing great things, teaching our community, helping uh, raise up our next generation of uh, young uh, men and women, boys and girls, uh, people who are doing great things in our local schools. Obviously, we're excited about back to school, some of us more than others, I guess, but nonetheless, excited about back to school and excited about the role that these schools play in our communities and the great teachers who make our schools great. We want to celebrate some of those. So when you go to dognation.com, you can nominate an outstanding teacher. Now, the cool thing is if one of our, uh, if your teacher that you nominate wins we're going to announce winners each day starting the week of august 7th if a teacher that you nominate wins they get four incredible gift cards including a hundred dollar gift card to kroger you get fifty dollar to home chef fifty dollar to bath and body works fifty dollars to target there as well so great uh four great gift cards there for our winning teachers but nominators also get a chance to be a big winner there too if you nominate one of the winning teachers you also get a fifty dollar gift card courtesy of kroger and a really cool Dog Nation uh, gift bag there as well, which includes a T-shirt, some other stuff there too. Talk about a hundred dollar value going the way of the nominators on this. So teachers can be winners. The nominators of the teachers they can be winners as well. We'll start announcing all of this the week of August seventh. So go to DogNation.com, nominate a great teacher, and maybe uh, he or she can be celebrated. Uh, the week of August 7th, as Kroger celebrates outstanding teachers with us right here on DogNation.com and, of course, Dog Nation Daily here today. All right, so Jake Fromm, before we're done, a lot to talk to Jake about. But for now, to keep the conversation going about Justin Williams and what's next for UG Recruiting and everything else related to these dogs right now, let's dive into all of that today with Connor Riley here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by ESOG. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let's bring in Connor Riley here, uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Connor and I had a chance, along with Jeff Sintel, to talk last night about Justin Williams, the five-star linebacker who commits to Georgia. And, you know, Connor, I don't think you can overstate the kind of prospect that I believe that Williams is. You watch the film, you see a guy who's just flying to the ball. I mean, just absolutely like a laser beam towards the football, which is what you want a linebacker to be. But when you also, you know, get chances to hear him, his high school teammate, Joseph Jonah Janye, you see the kinds of recruits that can be immediate contributors to Georgia's overall team culture, making the team better because they're on it. I mean, I don't see a negative here. I don't see a box that Williams doesn't check. This was a gigantic win for Georgia last night, was it not? Yeah, I mean, there just aren't a lot of human beings that are 6'2 right now, 205. Georgia's probably hoping to get him up to 220, 225. When they get him in the strength and conditioning program, you know, it, it is a safety that can hit like a linebacker. And Georgia's had a lot of success with those guys. Quay Walker types, Shmaw Munden types, uh, you know, Raylan Wilson types there. And, you know, as college football continues to evolve more into a pass-first game, having those kinds of guys that not only can drop back into coverage and, and create mismatches in that end of the field, but stuff the run, be aggressive blitzers, uh, is, is something that has been paramount to this Georgia defense. So long as Kirby Smart has been the head coach of this program, and you know we sort of touched on this last night, I think my biggest takeaway, all right now Georgia's got the number one inside linebacker commit in the country. They've got the number one cornerback commit in the country. There's a world where they have the number one safety commit and the number one defensive line commit as well. And we talk about how special that 2021 defense is and was. We're approaching a point in time where that might become the norm, given the defensive talent that they've signed in the 2022-2023 and are currently assembling in the 2024 recruiting class where you're going to have creek at every level of the field. And, you know, the joke has been uh, that Philadelphia is just drafting Georgia players on defense. Yeah. 
there might come a time when there's so much talent in Georgia defense that the Eagles might actually feel feel the full defense full of Georgia players because <laughs> that is how much talent Georgia is accumulating on the defensive side of the ball right now. And Justin Williams is just the latest example of that. That's fun to consider. And you know, I've said before, I think the 2021 Georgia defense deserves to be in the conversation for the greatest of all time. I mean, based on my understanding of the sport, I don't see an obvious argument for anyone being better. And yet I've also said the ultimate legacy of that defense is is they may eventually create kind of a proof of concept that allows Georgia to have an even better defense at some point in time in the future because guys want to have what that group had, five first-round picks, uh, you know, a lot of fun playing together, clearly dominating the competition, that ultimately it seems like that's really playing itself out where, you know, I don't know that you draw a straight line between, you know, Justin Williams and Kobe Dean and guys like that, but certainly it certainly helps to have had that kind of success in the past there that I think you do see some of that fruit kind of coming into blossom here of when you go out and have an all-time great defense, other great recruits kind of want to get a little bit of a taste of that for themselves. Right, and I don't think that Kobe Dean is the guy to follow an earmark off that 2021 defense that leads to the proof of concept that you're talking about. I actually think it's Channing Tindall, because okay. he was a guy who never started a game at Georgia, waited his time to make contributions, and really did not emerge as a viable every down player for Georgia until his senior year. Now he could have gone, he could have been a star at South Carolina as a sophomore. He could have played all over the SEC. But the fact that he doesn't start a game and it's still a third round pick at the NFL level, I think just shows the level of development and talent that is in this Georgia defense and how teams going forward now, I, I think are just going to be comfortable betting on certain skill positions or certain positions within this Georgia defense. Uh, you've seen four defensive linemen go in the first round over the last two years. I think now Stackhouse has a chance to make that five in this upcoming draft. Even though he's not some prodigious big name right now, I think he's going to have a big season. And teams are just going to fall back on the fact that, hey, look, Georgia knows what they're doing. They produce studs at all levels of the defense, and they're really going to lean on that. Kamari Lasseter is a guy. Well, we've seen Darian Kendrick and Keely Ringo emerge as really good cornerbacks and guys that were ultimately drafted in this Georgia system. He's probably the next man up there. And so the fact that, again, you're right to point out, Five first-round takes from that 2021 defense. And, you know, Trayvon Walker didn't start until his final year in college. Jalen Carter wasn't a starter until his final year in college. And those guys all still go in the first round. It shows that if you're, if you're willing to be patient and willing to do the work, you can still end up being not just a champion at the University of Georgia, but a first-round pick as well. We're showing a uh, photo on the screen of Justin Williams for those watching on video, and you see this, you know, Glenn Schumann standing next to him, huge smile on his face, which I think is a uh, really great photo. And, I think there's an element of Schumann that starts to feel a little bit like Todd Hartley to me from the standpoint that, you know, teams commonly play with five defensive backs in the game. That means from a recruiting standpoint, you can't – you're not going to bring in as many linebackers as you bring in other positions because teams just play with fewer linebackers in the field, regularly speaking. So, therefore, a guy like Schumann, much like Hartley with tight ends, you're only targeting a small number of players in each class. And to think that every single guy you bring in is essentially a banger, like every single guy you bring in is, you know, the level of a C.J. Allen or, or a Bowles or a Wilson last year, you know, a, you know, a Justin Williams-type player this year, much like Hartley seems to clean house with only exclusively top-flight tight ends. The fact that Schumann, small number of players that he's bringing in in each class, and yet all of them are, are seemingly of this caliber, it just sort of speaks to – the fact that you know his level of recruiting success, once again, that can't be overstated either, I don't believe. Right, and I actually think in the 2024 class, his past recruiting success worked against him. You know, in the 2023 cycle, he essentially got you know, to pick which linebackers they were going to take, and they took C.J. Allen first, then they took Raylan Wilson, and then they took Troy Bowles. And those are three of the top six linebacker prospects, I believe, from the 2023 recruiting cycle. And so when you have that level of talent ahead of you, Playing time is going to be tough to sell. You know, Jalen Walker is a guy I think would start for most SEC teams, and, you know, he's a third team and preseason all SEC player. He's not going to start for Georgia this year, it's provided that Shamal Munden is healthy. And, and so you look at that, and still, Georgia as it stands right now has a commitment from Demarcus Riddick. We'll see if that holds. Uh, Georgia pushed very hard to land Sammy Brown, and, you know, maybe if they don't have the talent in front of him, maybe he does end up going here. But, you know, Georgia still goes out, consensus number one linebacker prospect in the country in Justin Williams and, and Schumann. You know, Georgia was late to the game on this. Oregon put in a lot of work early on him. Texas and Alabama were teams that were recruiting him hard. He took an unofficial visit to Georgia in May with his teammate Joseph Jonah Ajanye and then did it again for an official visit in June. And that was sort of all she wrote for Georgia in terms of what doing what it needed to do to get Justin Williams. And so that speaks to, I, I think, Glenn Schumann's ability as a recruiter, his ability to connect with players, obviously his ability 
to develop players into NFL level players at the next level. And at this point, you know, I, I, the comparison to me, it's not Todd Hartley. He's Kirby Smart. It's Kirby Smart in the way that Kirby Smart was for Nick Saban there. You know, he's been with him since the start and he has grown in that role every year. And we touched on this in the show last night. You know, Glenn Schum is now at a spot where he can afford to be picky when it comes to, you know, the type of job that he wants to leave for. He's making $1.9 million this year. He's got a young family here in Athens. And this is a guy who has as bright a future as any coach in the game right now. One more thing on Williams. I want to shift gears from the other recruiting stuff that's out there. You know, to me, it's a big-time flex to also bring in a couple of players from the state of Texas of this caliber the year before Texas comes in the SEC. And, you know, last week you were in Nashville for SEC Media Days. I thought there were far more questions about Texas and Oklahoma than I would have preferred. Uh, you sort of expect some of that, and some of that's just based on the fact that I'm guessing local media from those markets, you know, travel to Nashville, and they're there for a reason. So, you know, that may be why you got so much of that flavor. But, but clearly there's a lot of sort of you know, calm before the storm vibe here in terms of the Longhorns and the Sooners being in this league here next year. Well, the fact that Georgia, you know, reminds once again that it can go into Texas and get big time players. I think that's a pretty good signal to send the year before Texas joins this league. Yeah, I can't recall in my lifetime if Georgia has played a game in the state of Texas. And going forward, you know, starting in 2024, maybe 2024, well, certainly starting in 2024 when they're at Texas. They're going to have two games in Texas over the course of every four years, which yeah. means, you know, players from Texas, they're going to get a chance to go back home and see their families and play in front of their families in those road environments there. And I don't think that's lost on Georgia. And, look, Georgia has been pushing for players from Texas for quite some time now. You know, Dylan Bell back in the 2021 cycle comes to mind. Uh, this is not some newfound thing, but I think they do realize that the door is more open in Texas now given the availability that we're just going to be playing there more often and, and, and whatnot. And, again, you know, we, we, we touched on this last night. As much as you want Georgia to land the local recruits, the Sammy Browns, the K.J. Boldens of the world, uh, the ability to go into Texas, to go into California, to go to all areas of the country, whether it be the Northeast or the Pacific Northwest, South Florida as well, and recruit well in a land elite talent, that, more than anything, is why Georgia has won the last two national championships. And as much as people would like to see Georgia sort of lock up the home state in a way that maybe Ohio State does or LSU does with Louisiana, there's far more talent outside the state of Georgia than there is in it, even with Georgia being, I believe, now the number two or number three state in the country in terms of producing blue chip prospects. Let's move on to what's next for Georgia recruiting. And obviously, I think the big name that's out there is williams Winery. And I had kind of joked about this, that – you know, Joseph Jonah Johnye kind of called a shot with Justin Williams. That works out. Winery is another player that he feels a little bit of a kinship with, and he'd like to have him at Georgia there as well. We know how hard Oklahoma's pushing on this. Obviously, there's a belief that the in-state school, Missouri, is pushing hard for Winery there too. Do you think all this momentum helps Georgia with the guy that on three now ranks number one prospect in the country? I, I do. Uh, you know, I think this is a recruitment, if I'm being honest, Winery probably doesn't know where he's going at this point. And, and Georgia, Oklahoma, and Missouri all have, uh, I think, unique pitches. You know, Oklahoma has been the team there the longest for, with Winery. Georgia has the best development track record. And then Missouri is obviously the home state school there. And, and look, I, I know people might scoff at the idea that Missouri, Missouri went head to head a few years ago with a Missouri prospect in Luther Burden and beat Georgia out for him. I was a player on that Georgia won quite badly. And, and so I don't think that they're to be discounted in this recruitment there. And one thing to keep in mind here, you know, Brent Venables went 6-7 and seven last year uh, in his first season at Oklahoma. Eli Drinkwitz has floated around 500 his entire time there. Uh, those are not exactly super safe job, secure jobs at, at those two respective programs where if they have a bad season this year, there are going to be a lot more questions asked. So not only do those programs need – Winery a little bit more than Georgia does. Uh, not that Georgia doesn't need a player of Winery's caliber, caliber, but when you have guys like Joseph Jonah, John Yett, and you have guys like Michael Williams, and you were able to recruit at that level consistently, you don't feel the need to land a player like Winery quite the way I think Oklahoma and Missouri do. But in the age of a transfer portal, let's say there is a coaching change to school Winery ultimately ends up at, Georgia's going to be a very attractive offer for him. And Kirby Smart has spoken about this, about – you know, with the transfer portal, the, you know, ability to not just keep recruiting, but to keep developing relationships with players in the sense that they might end up, you know, 
playing for you down the line, provided they fit the size and speed parameters that Georgia is looking for, as well as checking off some of the character background checks there as well. And, and Winery absolutely does that. So while a initial decision might be nearing for Winery there as well, even in the event that it's not Georgia, I think, you know, Georgia is going about recruiting in the right way. And, and even if they miss out on him, they're in a position to long-term benefit from the recruitment of one area that they've had. I want to talk about the all SEC stuff before I let you go here. Obviously, and I've said this now a couple times, 11 preseason first team all SEC names for Georgia is a remarkable number. And I want to get into, you know, kind of, you know, what you wrote about dognation.com today, some of the guys that weren't, you know, I guess quite eligible to be on that list and what that might mean for the rest of the season. But Connor, let me just restate something I've said before. If Georgia has 11 first-team All-SEC players at the end of this season, then not only will Georgia win the national championship, but it won't be particularly close. It wasn't particularly close a year ago, and 2023 would set up to be even more dominant than that. That's a level of uh, of individual talent dominance that I don't think any team in the SEC would have matched. And frankly, you know, there weren't a whole lot of stretches in terms of guys that got the preseason nod. Maybe Stackhouse was a little bit of an eye-opener for some people. Maybe McConkie was a little bit of an eye-opener for some people. But, you know, ultimately you can make a pretty good case for all 11 of those dudes. You know, it just sort of speaks to what at least has the potential to be, I believe, Connor, a historic Georgia team here this upcoming season. Yeah, for the sake of transparency here and filling out my all-SEC ballot, I think I only had nine Georgia players in total on the ballots there. And so the fact that they get 11 on the first team and 16 uh, across the all three teams there uh, is just mind-blowing. And to that level, you know, like, look, Georgia's not going to end the season with Dominic Lovett, who was not eligible to be voted, but was a first-team or OCC receiver a year ago. Ladd McConkey and Brock Bowers all on the first team, unless, you know, Georgia just decides, hey, we're going to throw the ball every down and allow those guys to put up big numbers. Um but, look, they could very easily have three, potentially four, first-team All-SEC offensive linemen with the talent that they have there, and that's how good uh, Stacey Serrell's room is there. On the defensive side of the ball, like, if, you know, maybe Kamari Laster was a little bit surprising, and I think his presence in Nashville last week certainly helped him. But Javon Bullard and Malachi Starks have made big plays at the collegiate level yeah. already, and entering another year, they figure to be in a better spot to make plays and contributions. I could certainly see a world where – you know, Shavon London at the end of the season, provided he's healthy and he's able to play, you know, 12, 11 games over the course of the season as he's entering fall camp with a, with a foot injury. Uh, I could certainly see him as a guy that makes first team all OCC. You know, Jermon Dumas Johnson is not to be discounted either as he was Georgia's linebacker representative there. So there's so much talent on this team. And while at the end of the season, 11 may not just be feasible, uh, it, it's very clear that this Georgia team is deep at every level of the offense, considering the fact that, you know, Carson Beck wasn't even a guy that could be voted on, but there were quite a few media members out there saying, you know, based on this crop of quarterbacks, I wouldn't mind, you know, taking Carson Beck and betting on the talent around him and thinking that he's going to put up big numbers this season at the end of the year, be a guy that could be a first-team All-SEC quarterback. So then let's pivot to what you wrote about then. What does it mean for the Georgia offense when you look at the guys who did make it along the offensive line, Bowers, McConkey? You know, when you look at those guys that did make the first team all SEC, knowing that Lovett wasn't eligible to be on there, that Beck, you know, not yet the name starter, you know, wasn't eligible to be on there, you know, either. Like, you know, what kind of potential can Georgia potentially unlock offensively because of that? Uh, my sort of big takeaway was there's going to be, a, 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 and he knows this, there's going to be an onus on Mike Bobo to push the right buttons here. Uh, because. It wasn't surprising to me other than Ladd McConkey, but McConkey's been a guy that's made big plays and big games throughout his career, and so he has a certain name recognition that comes with him. You know, Brock Bowers and Cedric Van Pran are the two best players to their position in college football. Uh, Amarius Mims might, by the end of the year, be the best offensive tackle prospect when it comes to the NFL draft. And, and Tate Ratledge is a guy who's going to be a year further removed from his foot injury and is entering essentially his third year as a starter in the SEC. And, and so none of those guys making the first team are all that surprising. It wouldn't surprise you if Beck or Lovett had a big year this season, given you know the expectations, along with the fact that there's a lot of talent around him. You're not going to be able to double Dominic Lovett because you probably have to double Brock Bowers. And so with all that talent, and you know, Kenna Milton's a guy who, and I wrote this morning, if you're telling me Kenna Milton's fully healthy and, and plays all 15 games, probably going to be a pretty good bet. He's going to make at least one of the all SEC teams at the end of the season. Health has just been his biggest question mark and concern. With all that talent around, the pressure is going to be on Mike Bobo to push the right buttons. 
and I think he can do it. I think he, you know, has always been a capable offensive mind, especially with what we saw at the end of his last Georgia tenure there in 2014. And while, yes, that was a long time ago, um, I, I do think that, you know, this offense is in a point where, you know, they're not going to need to rely on Carson Beck to make hero throws and make big plays in the way maybe, say, USC is with Caleb Williams because there's so much talent around him. He can simply drop back, find the open man, and Georgia can keep moving the ball efficiently. Connor, so There's a ton of talent and, and plays that, that Bobo can play with and work with, and, and it, it's going to be really interesting to see what Georgia's new offensive coordinator does this season. It's a very good point. Sorry for stepping on the uh, final, final couple of words there, but uh, very well said indeed. And we appreciate your time on our program here today. Look forward to reading plenty more from me there at dognation.com. And we will uh, talk to you soon here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by ESOG. Yep, as always, it was a pleasure. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, really fun and interesting stuff there from Connor Riley. A lot of potential out there for this Georgia offense here this season. And, I mean, you just have to say it. And you don't, I'm not trying to heap unnecessary hype or be, be overly hyperbolic, but, you know, the level of individual attention a lot of these Georgia players are getting, if it comes together in that way for the upcoming season, then truly the sky could be the limit. You could be talking about a historic pursuit of a third straight national championship for Georgia and everybody at that point in time you would think would be forced to recognize exactly what's happening here in Athens, although I'm sure there'll be plenty of media types who'll have their own agenda as they oftentimes do. Before we bring on Jake Fromm, let's get ready to go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Remind you, this is a great time to take a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. In fact, it's a great time to start thinking about April of 2024 and being a part of the next Dog Nation cruise, bigger and better than it's ever been as we set sail on an Oasis-class ship. I'm talking about a lure of the seas here. April 22nd through the 26th next year, that's what we're going to be doing, leaving out of Port Canaveral, going to Nassau on the Bahamas, going to Perfect Day Coco Cay, and I can't even begin to tell you the fun and exciting things are going to be on board this great cruise ship, Allure of the Seas. This is a bigger cruise ship than we've been on before. This is an exciting opportunity. And to kind of meet the moment here, Dog Nation is going to have more specially themed events there as well. Jessica Slater, great travel agent. She's got a website she's put together for you. It's called RoyalDogs.com. Of course, dog spelled D-A-W-G-S. RoyalDogs.com. Go to the website. Find out about the Dog Nation cruise, April of 2024. What a great experience that is going to be. All right, let me do a couple of SEC through stories here for a moment. We got an update yesterday. ESPN's College Game Day will be to begin the season in Charlotte, North Carolina, as South Carolina takes on North Carolina. Now, there was a little bit of chatter yesterday I noticed online related to the fact that, well, if game day is going to UNC, South Carolina, then it must be kind of a lackluster week one. I guess in, you know there's certainly no Georgia Oregon this year the way there has been in the past. We have to wait a week for Texas and Alabama. That's obviously a huge game, but that's a week two game and a week one game. You know Utah Florida is on a Thursday, so when you look at that Saturday slate, you know maybe it does sort of seem like you're kind of missing some of the big stuff. I think that Florida State uh, LSU is one of the biggest games that will be played all year long. But I guess my overall point here is is. I think South Carolina and North Carolina is actually a really fun game. And maybe that just makes me sort of a college football dork to be as into this as I kind of am. But I think this is a pretty big game here for this upcoming season. I don't, I don't have a problem with game day being there, given the other choices they would have had in a uh, week one type situation here. Drake May is obviously you know, a big time quarterback. A lot of folks would think maybe the best quarterback in the entire country. Certainly a guy who's going to have a chance to be the number one overall pick. Don't forget, if you look at some of the early betting lines that have been out there, UNC's been the early favorite here. They've been about a, a field goal or so favored against South Carolina, which is, to me, a little bit eye-opening, given the way that South Carolina concluded the regular season. They obviously had the big win against Tennessee, the big win against Clemson, yet they find themselves in the underdog position to UNC. This is not a game that South Carolina needs to lose, though. This is the type of game, neutral site, relatively even fair fight, at least on paper, that if you're a Shane Beamer, you need to win. Big spotlight in this game, I believe, on Dowell Loggins, the brand-new South Carolina offensive coordinator. That's a guy who's got a lot to prove. This is a guy that, you know, was tight ends coach at, at Arkansas, you know, doesn't have that big sort of play-calling background, but gets a chance to sort of step up at the next level here with Shane Beamer in South Carolina. I think that it's unfair to probably ask Rattler to outplay Drake May, Spencer Rattler, but it's another chance for him to have a big game much like we saw him have at times at the end of last season, really kind of established himself as one of the better quarterbacks. And potentially, if South Carolina wins this game, then it doesn't it make South Carolina's trip to Athens a couple of weeks later feel a little bit more interesting, a lot more fun. So 
I think UNC South Carolina, maybe you have to be a big time college football fan to think of this as a big game, but I do think of this as a pretty big game. My guess is most of you do as well. I saw where Jordan Rogers from the SEC Network <laughs> has said, I guess the quote here is, there is, let me, the, the quote is something the effect of, there is no more talented quarterback in the entire country than Tennessee's Joe Milton, and Rogers kind of money line there on that, and it's not even close. So Jordan Rogers, the, net, the SEC Network analyst, heaping praise on Tennessee quarterback Joe Milton here. Now, this was as easy to predict as anything ever. We've been saying this for months that you could have looked at last year's NFL draft going back to like April with uh, you know Will Levis and Anthony Richardson, guys whose skill set, talent level would seem to have superseded their on-field performances, and you could say a year from now Joe Milton's going to be that guy, the guy with the big arm. And listen, there's no doubt Joe Milton can throw it over the mountains. I mean, he is, he is a big-armed quarterback. But in terms of actual tangible accomplishments as a quarterback, that's actually pretty thin. You had a chance to win the Tennessee starting quarterback job, did not. He came to Tennessee because he also lost his job there at Michigan too. Now, my guess is in a Tennessee offense with Josh Heupel, my guess is Milton's probably a pretty successful quarterback. You know, But ultimately, I would say that some of the hype, probably a lot of the hype that Jordan Rodgers is throwing on him probably ends up not quite being uh, what it's cracked up to be. But we'll follow that when the season takes place. And I was going to do another story. Let me just kind of save that for tomorrow. And we'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And here on Dog Nation Daily, we'll shift gears here. We'll do our Kroger Fresh take. We'll bring on uh, a, a great former Georgia quarterback in Jake Fromm, who's busy right now getting ready for an upcoming NFL training camp and uh, preseason. He's getting ready to be underway there, too. Jake, we appreciate your time here today as part of our Kroger Fresh take. We hope you're doing well. Hey, Brandon, what's going on? Uh, thank you for having me, and happy to be here. I guess let me start with this. How has it been, early days of training camp? You've been up there, and for your organization, the Washington Commanders, there's also a kind of a transition in ownership, too. Is that the kind of thing that players really notice? I mean, is there anything different about that transition kind of taking place right now that, that, that you've had to, I guess, be aware of, or is it impacting your life in any way whatsoever at the moment? Yeah, it's uh, it's been really good. We've had a rookie camp here before all the vets and everybody reports uh, here today. Um, but uh, no, it's been good, man. It's a great buzz around the building, um, and uh, really just excited to be here. It's an exciting time, um, and you know, there's a lot kind of going on. Um, but it's not necessarily anything that we can kind of uh, control or do. You know, it's not really much for us to do, man. We're here to to go uh, and have a good camp, and that's what we're focused on. So. Um, nothing crazy, but uh, we are excited about what's going on. Well, as we told you before, we certainly wish you well as you do all of that. Um, we've talked a little bit this week about the fact that I'm, I don't even know if you've had a chance to see this. Last week, Georgia had like 16 preseason All SEC guys, 11 on the first team alone. Jake, you've played in this league, you've played on some good teams, you've played against some good teams. You know the SEC as well as anybody. Can you imagine any team having 11 first-team All-SEC players? And what kind of talent level does that speak to, the fact that Georgia's even in a conversation for something like that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's super impressive. Um, that's just a, a, just a large amount of respect, one, to the, to the players themselves, two, to uh, Coach Smart, the way he recruits, uh, the way uh, the system is developing players. Um, and continually putting guys out um, into the draft and into the NFL uh, and having success. So, uh, man, that's just a huge amount of respect. And, uh, man, it's, uh, it's a lot to, to live up to. And I know these guys are, are very capable of doing so, but I think it's just about, you know, for them uh, kind of putting their head down and going to work this camp and, um, and having a good season. I, I think a lot of rewards um, and kind of accolades when it comes to those kind of things um, is really – more about the team and how well yeah. the team does and be able to have team success. So that's kind of what, what you're seeing is the, 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 the benefits uh, of that. Well, I've said this before. I think one of my favorite things about football, I actually talked to this with our one of our guests yesterday. One of my favorite things about football is is it's almost it doesn't really ask you to make the choice. I mean, sometimes you have to give up individual accolades for team success. But listen, a Georgia player having a first team all SEC type season, putting himself in the conversation, be a first round draft pick, you know, that benefits the team too, right? It's like you don't really have to ask a player, I don't think, to you know, not want to be the very best player you can be individually because when you have a collection of those guys that achieve at kind of their top end level of performance, that makes the team better, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody's pitching in uh, for the common goal, 
Um, I mean, this is from my perspective. Everybody's pitching in to uh, to win a national championship, uh, to win the SEC championship, uh, win the East Division first, you know. So, uh, and kind of everything else that comes along with that. I mean, to me, it's just icing on the cake. So, um, you know, hopefully, a lot of these guys don't don't start thinking about maybe personal matters, and you know, hey, if, if I get this, maybe I can go, you know, this in the draft. So and so, man. To me, the most important thing you can do um, and think about, man, is winning winning football games. Because the more that team wins. Um, the, the more it's going to look like you help the team benefit, um, and it's going to only help your stock, um, in my opinion. How much does it help the quarterback if we just assume for a moment it's Carson back when you've got at least you know three potential all SEC level offensive linemen, a pass catching target like Brock Bowers, a pass catching target like Lad McConkey? They were both both first team all SEC there as well. You know guys like you know Kendall Milton gets acknowledged. You know Dominic Lovett who transfers in, he could be there by the end of the year there too. Like how much does it make that transition for a new starting quarterback knowing you've got so much talent that you can help? lean on rely on to make that transition seemingly a little smoother for you how much does that help georgia's new quarterback to me it does a little bit of both one in, in one sense it takes a little bit of the pressure off because you know you have really good guys around you uh to uh man just just put it in their hands make a play or you know you're gonna have a little bit of extra time because you know the offensive line you mentioned um but then also to me it, it also puts a lot of pressure on you too because you know you have good guys around you so really it's up to me to perform to get the most out of the guys uh, around me so um, it, it can kind of work both ways however you want to argue it um, but uh, I, I think uh, Coach Smart and Coach Bobo are going to do, do a great job of, of putting Carson or whoever it is in the, in the right position to succeed and um, man just, just let the offense take care of business and the defense stop people and and win football games you know that's what it's all about. One of those guys that got that first team all SEC nod was a lad McConkey and you know, to me, Jake, Ladd is an amazing story. And at one point in time, I mean, I don't, I don't mind telling you this. I never expected Ladd to have the kind of success at Georgia that he's had. I'm embarrassed to say that now because of how wrong that opinion would have turned out to be. But I could not have predicted this. And yet, ultimately, this is the player who he is. And it sort of seems like now we've kind of gone from him being, at one point in time, sort of an underrated, overlooked player to now he's one of the guys that was also – first team all sec last week that he has not only arrived as a big time player he is now getting the proper credit for that there as well i don't know how well you know lad but what do you make of his evolution as a player yeah i i love lad man i love Lad as a player I love Lad as a person um and i mean to me uh, from a quarterback's perspective uh, a guy like lad is just uh, a quarterback's best friend man it's a guy you can count on he's gonna be in the right spot uh, at the right time, uh, he's going to be a guy you can go to to make a play. Um, I mean, his skill set, you know, he's, he, man, he's, he's fast, uh, he's sneaky, twitchy, um, and, man, he just finds a way to get open. So, um, from a quarterback's perspective, man, I, I, I love it. He's a great playmaker, uh, man, and, and, and someone who I would rely on heavily uh, to throw the ball to. It's our Kroger Fresh Take with Jake Fromm here on Dog Nation Daily here today. And speaking of Kroger, don't forget, back to school is here, whether you want it to be or not. Teachers getting ready to go back. Students getting ready to go back. Uh, that may or may not be good news for you, depending on your perspective. But here's something that is definitely very good news. Great back-to-school savings with our friend at Kro- friends at Kroger. You can stop by and see them uh, in a local store or go to Kroger.com to find out more about this. And listen to this. you got select school supplies right now at Kroger for under a dollar. Plus, there are 250 items that are under $3 three dollars right now at your local kroger so you got the pencils the, the the crayons all that kind of stuff that you need to get back to school you're getting great savings on all of that at your local kroger so stop by and see them in store or go to kroger.com for more details on that and as jake as we get ready to wrap up with you here today oh, one more topic i wanted to address with you for a moment this is a guy who was just sort of beginning his coaching career when you were there at Georgia. That's Glenn Schumann, linebacker's coach, who's now kind of emerged as a co-defensive coordinator at UGA. Georgia won a big recruiting battle for a linebacker yesterday, so uh, Schumann's getting a lot of attention for that. And for those of us who are fans of this team, we have seen Schumann really grow into the role of kind of a rising star in the coaching ranks. How much of that did you recognize when you were at Georgia about what he could be? I know it's the other side of the ball, and so maybe you didn't interact with him all that much necessarily. But did you see back then in Glenn Schumann what everybody seems to see now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, man, guys always love Coach Shue. Uh, man, they flock to him because um, I think he just did such a great job of just building relationships uh, with the guys. And, uh, Coach Shue was all, all over the place at practice. He'd always wear his gray sweatsuit. Um, and it didn't matter, 
if it was, you know, 100 degrees outside yeah. or 20 degrees outside, that thing was just soaking and dripping wet by the end of every practice. So he's getting after it. Um, and, and, you know, pro, you know, from a player's perspective, I mean, here's a coach who's, who's, you know, putting in the same work at practice that I am, you know, so he, he's breaking a sweat too. And, um, man, that's what we love to see. So, um, no, Co- Coach Hugh has it, man. He, he knows all the X's and O's. Uh, about defense, and um, I think he's going to have a, a great coaching career going forward. Like, if, I guess put us inside here for a minute. Like, how much interaction do you have with defensive coaches? Like, do you feel like you get to know them pretty well? Like, how much quarterback? I mean, I'm sure some of it's trash talk during scrimmages and things like that. But like, how much? Like, how much interaction are you having with defensive coaches on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, I think every player and, and coach is slightly different, but I, I've always felt like I made really good relationships uh, with coaches on the other side of the ball. Uh, one, you know, a lot in the competitive spirit, you know, at practice and during camp, spring, all those good things. But, um, I mean, too, I mean, you know, they're, they're on your team. So um, just really just trying to get to know people, um, and that way you can try to get the most out of people. Jake, it's always great to talk to you. Best of luck up there with Commander's Training Camp. We can't wait to watch you play some preseason games here coming up. We can't wait to watch football of any kind coming up. So uh, we're excited about that preseason football, uh, to be sure. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you as part of Kirk Fresh Jake again very soon on Dog Nation Daily as well. Right, Brad. Thank you. Yes, sir. Love having Jake from. You know, it reminds me of like you know, baseball players sometimes say that you know hitters like to talk to pitchers, or you know hitters like to talk to pitching coaches, things like that. Could get a little bit of a mindset about what they're seeing when they're out there doing battle. I'm sure Jake from kind of hanging out with some of those defensive coaches. Maybe that's the same way. And nice words for him kind of recognizing what Glenn Schumann's all about, including the fact that if you ever get a chance to you know go see a Georgia practice or something like that, it is. It is shocking to see the fact that Glenn Schumann is always wearing full-on sweatsuit, like that thick, fleecy sweatsuit. Pants, shirt. I don't know that I'd advise other people to do that in the Georgia heat, but it seemingly works for Coach Shue, and I guess it kind of always has. Good point there by Jake Fromm on that. How about a golden shoe today? Speaking of Schumann, who helped Georgia win a big recruiting battle with uh, Justin Williams, our buddy Chase here. Chance Dog 19 on Twitter saying, beautiful night to land another five-star and catch up on the latest from Dog Nation Daily. Hashtag go for three and 23. We appreciate Chase doing that. Y'all check him out over at 7-6. You'd love to see that big uh, golden shoe win there. How about the lousy stinking Gators there as well? 95 days from now. It feels good to know that we're kind of inside 100 days. A lot of you take 95 to get to Jacksonville. And so 95 days from now, we'll see Georgia dragging Florida around again. That's fun to think about. Gator hater countdown. We'll see you tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by engineered solutions of georgia and on video time now for the rs andrews cool down r s andrews the one you turn to for your air conditioning heating plumbing and electric needs showing up on time doing the work that's promised for the price that's promised uh, that is what rs andrews is all about so we'll take your comments we'll kind of find out what kind of mood y'all are in today loved jake from as usual interesting stuff from connor riley there as well lad mcconkey getting a lot of deserved attention Justin Williams' reaction is uh, certainly very enjoyable right now, too. So we're all over all of it here today. And it includes your comments here right now. Uh, Frederick Meredith says, Lads turned out to be the best wide receiver from the 2020 class. It featured Jermaine Burton, Aaron Smith, Marcus Rosemey Jackson, and uh, Justin Robinson. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously right now the, uh, the results only speak for themselves. I think we're going to still hear from Aaron Smith in a very big way right now. But, you know, Lad McConkey is just a good player. And you can say, well, body type-wise, size-wise, things like that, maybe that's not what you'd have expected. I would have probably been, been in that camp at one point in time. But here it is. It is real, and it is upon us. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Joey Smith says, when does fall camp start? Next Thursday is when it all goes down for those dogs. Jay Song says, are you scared of my Orioles yet? Hey, listen, it's been a good year for Baltimore. No doubt about that. Been a good year for Baltimore, and maybe we'll see a uh, little bit of a matchup at some point in time between the Braves and the Orioles there in the World Series. That would not be a bad thing at all, I don't think. Uh, (laughs) Right now, as a baseball fan, I'm sort of scared of some other things. I mean, I do think the Braves, you know, they got to be careful in the back end with the the, uh, bullpen, things like that. They've got a little bit of stuff they've probably got to work on right there. I actually, I said this to some of our people yesterday on our early video show what we call first and 15 before the show starts i am certainly not one to panic because the braves had lost two series in a row but at the same time i was glad to see them get the win on sunday and get the series win in milwaukee i was glad to see that not because 
I thought the Braves were tail spinning or anything like that, but you know, you just want to win games. And so I was actually pretty happy to see them win on Sunday. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there you go. Dog Nation Shark Week. So I also said this earlier, too. I feel like we've seen a lot of shark content on the Internet as of lately, for those of you that are on social media and things like that. Now, I know we're actually in Shark Week. I realize that's going on right now. But I'm talking about sort of unofficial Shark Week. Like I've seen a few shark videos lately that are unnerving. Unnerving. And see, I believe there's actually like a really big shark conspiracy. Where like I think that like there's a certain like community of like scientists and things like that. They've tried to like domesticate sharks or something. No, domesticate's probably the wrong word. I think they've tried to like sort of like take the fear out of sharks. And I feel like it's gone too far. Like I feel like this thing of, oh, these sharks aren't here to hurt you. You know, they're more afraid of you than you are of them. A lot of that kind of stuff. I feel like we I feel like we've kind of gone too far in terms of like I don't even know what the word is. That's not humanizing the sharks. But I feel like there's a conspiracy to make sharks seem less dangerous than they are. Um, I've seen the movies. I know how dangerous they are. I feel like, I feel like we've kind of got that out there right now. And some of these videos may be... <laughs> because like, like one of the videos of the day I saw... Like I'm not even going to describe what some of the videos were. But like one of the videos of the day, it's like this dude like put his hand in the water with a shark right there. And the shark bit its finger off. Bit his finger off. It's like... You shouldn't do that. But if it wasn't for all this, you know, all these, you know, sort of <laughs> narratives about, ah, oh, these sharks, you know, they don't want anything to do with humans. <laughs> Not the videos I've seen. In the videos I've seen, the sharks were more than happy to, uh, you know, be around humans, chomp on the humans, whatever else. But that's probably. Um, Nature Gator says don't feed alligators or sharks. Real bad idea. Yeah, totally agree on alligators too. And alligators, I think, because like like nature, obviously being down there in Florida, you know he sees this. To me, alligators are really weird. I've said this before; they're sort of docile until they're not. It's like you, if you see an alligator on the side of like a pond or a creek bank or something like that. In Florida, they're everywhere. If you see it just sort of laying there, it just sort of looks like a statue. The thing doesn't move. It it comes across as if it has no concern for you whatsoever. But when it decides it wants to get in act, get into the action, it changes fast. Those things move fast. They whack you with their tail. Um, you know, they're sort of docile until they're not. And once again, you see, I guess I must, I, I guess I must get fed a lot of these sort of like redneck videos of people doing stuff with animals they're not supposed to do. I guess I probably get you know more of that that stuff than a sophisticated person would probably get. But you see these people sort of messing around with alligators. And nature's right. You don't need to do that. First of all, it's, just, it's not good to be mean to animals. But second of all, that alligator is going to rip you limb from limb. It may seem like it's not going to. But the moment it changes its mind, it is over. Over. Um, Taylor Russell says, have I seen many sharks in Royal Caribbean? I have not. See, the good thing about the Bahamas is the water's clear. Uh, like, like you go to perfect day, Coco Cay, water's clear, more clear than the swimming pool. Honestly, like going on a Royal Caribbean cruise makes it a little harder for me to want to swim in the regular ocean because the regular ocean's not clear. The regular ocean, you can't see anything. Uh, at least what I think of as the regular ocean. You know, I grew up going on the Atlantic, things like that in Florida. You can't see anything. You get in the water in the Bahamas, you can see all the way down to the, to the ocean floor. You can see your feet. Uh, it's clear as can be. So if a shark comes up, I'm going to see it because uh, the water's super clear. Water in the regular Atlantic is not super clear. There's no telling. Like, I remember one time uh, I was hanging out at the beach, and, like, this guy was just, like, just fishing from shore all day long. And, like, you know, I didn't pay any attention to him. But, like, a few hours after a couple hours doing this, he reels in. That's a little hammerhead shark thing. It's like, oh, gosh, is that in the water, like, out there? Ugh. But no, I have not. I have not seen a shark on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation because, luckily, you could see if there was, you could see it coming. Um, now, Christy says that some sharks are sand color; you can't see them. Now, Christy, why would you tell me that? If that's true, I don't want to know it. If that's true, I don't want to know it. Uh, Jerry Dog fan says, "Do you trust Bo to call the right play for UGA when the win is on the line?" I think I do. I, I really do. And I, I think, on the one hand, and I think Connor kind of touched on this earlier. The expectation, rightly so, is very, very high. Not just because of the talent level that Georgia has, 
but because of how good the previous offensive coordinator was. Make no mistake about it. Todd Munkin was very, very good. So the expectation is justifiably high. And I think that Bobo is a guy that I trust to meet the moment. For instance, for those of us who follow this stuff pretty closely, is there anybody else that Georgia could have hired that you would have wanted more than Mike Bobo? I don't think there necessarily is. Now, in, in some respects, that's not a fair question because, I mean, Todd Munkin wasn't – I mean, I knew who Munkin was, but he wasn't really on my radar before Georgia hired him. So, you know, it could be that, you know, they were off-the-radar names that would have been very good and potentially very successful for, for, for UGA. But uh, this is not one of those things where you're going to wish you'd hired the other guy or wish you had the other guy. Y'all, there's not a lot of other guys. I mean, I've cited this before. Like, I'm not saying that Georgia should have wanted Kenny Dillingham as offensive coordinator, but think about Dillingham, who was Oregon offensive coordinator a year ago. This is a very young guy. Do you know that he is head coach at Oregon, at Arizona State now? Head coach. That if you're a sharp – I mean, like Garrett Riley's Clemson offensive coordinator right now, that's a young guy too – if he has a good year, he'll be head coach somewhere else next year. That These offensive coordinators just don't last as coordinators very long. They just don't. They become head coaches. So there's not as large a pool of potential offensive coordinator hires as it is. And so because of that, you know, I don't know there was some obvious name that was way better for Georgia than what Bobo is, especially given the fact that Kirby and Mike are close and Kirby's comfortable with him. And if you want Kirby Smart to last – for 20 or 25 years as Georgia coach. If you want that to be his legacy at UGA, long, continuous history of success, then you've got to bake some easy years into the cake for him. You cannot have him burn the candle at both ends the way that he has all these years for the next 20 years. You just can't ask anybody to do that. Eventually, I mean, energy is a finite resource. Eventually, you run out of it. So you've got to find some easy years somewhere. And a year in which you know your defensive coordinator, at least co-defense coordinator, is must champ, and your offensive coordinator is Mike Bobo, two good Kirby friends, close confidants, that has the potential of being an easy year. Uh, and those easy years potentially tack on more years to the back end of Kirby's career, I believe. So that is why. Uh, Jay Scheib says, what about Joe Brady as a uh, potential offensive coordinator hire? I don't think that Joe Brady has any interest in coming back to college football. I mean, um, I mean, he's been, I think, pursued, and y'all know, I'm at least we've been with us for a while, I was a big Joe Brady fan at LSU. Talking about a transformative figure, he clearly was. But Brady, after being Carolina Panthers head coach, um, he's like uh, uh, he's like a quarterback's coach of Buffalo or something. I mean, he's not even a coordinator anymore. But he is not interested in the college game, I don't believe, because I think he could have come to college, been a a very well-paid college OC, apparently he does not want that job because I think he's just a position coach in the NFL now. Um, Scott Harris says, most of us like Bobo, but would you consider him a downgrade from Todd Monken? I heard you call the Browns replacement a downgrade. So I think that Dan Enos is probably a downgrade from Kendall Browns. I think that is probably true. Do I think that Bobo is a downgrade from Todd Monken? I think right now the prob- I think that right now he probably is. I think right now Bobo is probably a lesser OC in my mind than Todd Munkin is. Um, the caveat to that is two things. Munkin wanted to leave, and I think that Munkin kind of always wanted to leave. Todd Munkin's another one of these guys that I think wanted to be in the NFL. He came to Georgia because he was unhirable in the NFL after the way the Cleveland Brown situation played out. Georgia rehabilitated his image, and now he's back calling plays again for the Baltimore Ravens. That's what I believe that Todd Munkin wanted to do. It was always a short-term proposition. Georgia benefited Munkin. Munkin benefited Georgia. It was a good relationship. Um, If Munkin was available for Georgia right now, would I want uh, Munkin to be Georgia's offensive coordinator? I, I think I probably still would just because of how successful he was. However, that doesn't mean that Mike Bobo couldn't achieve the same level of success, and it doesn't mean that Mike Bobo could not have a better season in 2023 than, than Todd Munkin ever had. He'll have the potential to do that, and he's obviously still a young enough guy. And let's face it, from a coaching standpoint, Bobo is still a very young guy. He's got many more years of his coaching life to tell the, the story of. So, you know, part of the reason why we think of Munkin as maybe a better offensive coordinator is he's a little older, been around a little longer. You know, he's had more opportunity to kind of, you know, produce. You know, Bobo is still, from a coaching standpoint, a fairly young dude. I mean, he was playing at Georgia's recently as 1997, so it's not like he's, you know, the oldest guy in the world here. So 
10 years from now, do we still think of Munkin as a better offensive coordinator than Mike Bobo? We might not. At that point in time, Mike Bobo might fully establish himself as a true play caller. Because when you think about small sample sizes, small sample sizes can be misleading. In other words, you know, you've got some Georgia years for Bobo that I think look pretty good. You've got a year at Auburn that does not look very good, and a year at South Carolina as offensive coordinator that does not look very good. However, was that South Carolina situation something that Bobo takes the blame for, or is that a situation where the program was essentially already kind of eroding to the point where Bobo couldn't save it, and so therefore it may have been a bad year, but it wasn't necessarily Bobo's fault. The Auburn situation, I think you can very easily claim that wasn't Bobo's fault because Auburn hired a head coach in Brian Harson it should have never hired before. So it could be very easy in the next couple of years for Bobo to coach at Georgia in such a way that makes people forget he was ever at South Carolina or ever at Auburn, that his coaching career is still a long way away from being – the story of that career is a long way away from being written, that eventually he could establish himself as a better offensive mind than Todd Munkin. But for now, you know – I don't know how many offensive coordinators were better than, than Todd Monk in the last couple of years, so it seems fair to say uh, that Georgia had itself a good one a year ago. Uh, the other caveat to this is is that while Munkin may appear to at the moment be the superior offensive coordinator, there's no doubt that Bobo is the better recruiter, and there's no doubt that Georgia's overall recruiting apparatus was strengthened with, with the hire of Mike Bobo because of the fact that's something he kind of embrace, embraces. Uh, Christy says, if Bobo doesn't do well, do you think Kirby will put the friendship on back burner and let him try again if the season is bad? Well, I think two things about that, Christy. Thing number one is is that ultimately Kirby Smart is a tenacious competitor, and I think he understands the old adage of it's not show friends, it's show business, that ultimately Kirby Smart is going to do what's right for business, even if that means you know not necessarily doing right by friends. So if there was ever a need to move off a Muschamp or move off a, a you know, move off of a, a a Mike Bobo, I do trust Kirby Smart to make that decision. I don't think that Kirby Smart would allow loyalty to cloud his judgment there on that. I also think, you know, the idea that George would do poor enough offensively that Bobo would need to be fired in the next couple of years. I don't really quite see that as all that likely. Um, you know, I mean it just seems like this situation set up pretty well where I don't see Georgia firing any coaches anytime soon. Um, so, I mean, you know, could, could Bobo n- not work out? Yeah. You know, obviously it's a possibility if it, if it does happen, I do think that Kirby would very easily make the decision to move on. And in fact, Bobo would probably, you know, help with that. He would step down himself. So Kirby wouldn't have to, you know, they'll preserve the friendship and they'll do what's right for George football there. The, you know, certainly that would be the case. But I just – I have a hard time for seeing that even being a likelihood or a possibility. I mean, the biggest thing that Bobo is going to have to live up to is Georgia scored 50 – was it 43 in the uh, Peach Bowl and then 65 in the National Championship. That's the biggest issue. You look at what Georgia averaged in three postseason games a year ago – that's where Bobo's going to really be judged. And that's where a lot of what you know he's all about will kind of uh, be determined. Um, thank you for your comment, Christy. Appreciate that. Really good, really good conversation. Um, David Jackson says, Alabama is getting so old now we feed them soup, which is really funny. Very funny. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, uh, Christopher Vale on the, going back to the old days of Georgia football saying, you know, in the previous Rick Dare, you had great skills position starters, average offensive line. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that Bobo is going to have at his disposal this year is just the quality of offensive line that Georgia produces is just so good now. And I really think that's an unheralded part of the championship story. This offensive line depth you know, the thing where Georgia can sustain a couple of injuries and not have a drop-off at offensive line. I mean, that makes a lot of people into a better offensive coordinator. And I don't think that that even on the better, you know, ricked teams, I don't believe that that Bobo ever had an offensive line near the one he's going to have right now. I just don't believe that he did. Um, I think you're right about that. 
Uh, let's see what else. Let me go to uh, dognation.com for a minute, and then we'll go to uh, Facebook for a minute, and we'll see how everybody's doing there. All right. Back over at dognation.com for a minute. Roger Hall says, I don't see Bama or UGA missing a 12-team playoff for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I think that the the 12-team playoff is going to be a benefit. What we sort of think of as sort of that upper tier of teams, you know, there's always someone left out of a four-team playoff. Alabama would say it was them in 2022. Georgia was certainly it in 2018. Um, There's always going to be somebody left out. But in the future, that kind of team won't be left out of the postseason anymore. And if you put – let's say you made a playoff bracket. It's going to be 12 teams. Let's say you put six teams who are sort of in the most deserving category. This would be TCU. It would be Michigan. uh, It would be the ACC champion. You know, oftentimes that might be Clemson. you got six teams who are kind of the most deserving. And you've got another half of the bracket, the six teams who are just the best. Because we always have that debate of, well, who should make the playoff, the most deserving or the best? Oftentimes the committee has chosen the most deserving. That would have been TCU a year ago. In the future, though, when you've got most deserving playing against best, most talented, whatever else, you better believe that the favorite in most cases is going to be the better team, even if they had a couple of bad losses. Those teams just become really difficult to beat. Georgia would have been in 2018. Alabama, for the most part, would have been a year ago. I don't think Alabama was nearly as good as its fans think it was. But if you had a 12-team playoff, that would have been a tough. That would have been a tough game for most teams playing against Alabama. Uh, it would have been, you know, I'm you know thinking of other examples. You know, there would have been lots of years in which that team excluded from the playoff would have been a very tough out in the playoff if you put you know, good, talented teams who had one or two disappointing losses. If you put them in the playoff, they would have been a very tough out in the postseason in a way that kind of a one-loss conference champion isn't always. And so that's what it's going to look like, where you may start with the 12-team playoff with a whole bunch of conference champions, a whole, bu- whole bunch of teams with pretty records, but it's the overall more talented, deeper teams, regardless of their records, that will emerge during the postseason. You very easily could have a situation where the national championship in the future is like a 10-2 and SEC team playing a 9-3 and SEC team because, you know, who knows what happens during the year, some sort of weird injury, football takes a weird bounce on you, whatever else. But eventually talent sort of emerges. And in a longer college football postseason – there's going to be more of an emphasis placed on who has the overall, you know, greater level of talent. AJ Ferraro says a 12 team playoff is only going to make it harder for Cinderella type teams to make the national championship game. Depth's going to prevail over the course of a 16 game schedule. I think that's true. If it was a 64 team tournament, you bring the underdogs back into it, but going from four to 12, you make it worse for the underdogs. You definitely do. Uh, Randy Hall says, see the comment on Bronny James. Uh, let's see what, what, what that is. Are you serious? Bronny James had a medical incident. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you many, uh, that's what Randy Hall says. That's a sad and, uh, scary thing. Uh, Bronny James, one of the top basketball prospects, son of LeBron James. Uh, I don't have a health update for you on that, but a, uh, a serious, scary thing there for Bronny James, who um, gives some context for those that don't really follow that sport. I believe he ranks as on threes, number one NIL athlete right now. Obviously very famous as the son of LeBron James. Uh, uh, very, very scary. Very scary. Uh, certainly prayers out to LeBron and his family on that. Uh, yeah, Brandon ESPN says – it's 24 minutes ago. Bronny James is stable and out of ICU after suffering a cardiac arrest while practicing at USC on Monday. Very, very scary. Uh, very scary indeed. Um, is he a senior in high school? I, I guess I don't know that. He is a senior in high school. Is that right? Um, uh, so a or, or, or rising senior, I guess. A rising senior, is that right? I apologize for not knowing that. Uh, but a very scary thing, scary thing indeed. So we'll we'll follow that, and I'll let you know where it goes. 
not easy to transition back to regular comments, but we'll try to do a couple of those. Um, funny stuff from DT in here. Uh, Bill Russell says, was it 1976 when James Brown sang Dooley's Junkyard Dogs at halftime? I believe that was 76, I think. Um, really some amazing video to go back and see you know, that performance from James Brown. And by the way, the Dooley's Junkyard Dog song from James Brown, he, you know, uh, unbelievable song, great song, and really kind of a big deal. I don't, I don't think we can kind of fully process. I mean, James Brown was like the coolest dude in the world when he's doing that song for Georgia. Of course, this is before I was born, so I'm only having to sort of make sense of this kind of in the after effect. But, I mean, as cool a dude as exists in pop culture at the time, and he's doing a song about Georgia football, that's – really amazing like my first experience with James Brown was Apollo Creed coming to the ring in Rocky Four. I'd never even heard of James Brown prior to that uh so that was my first experience with James Brown so I had a lot to learn about who James Brown was but the thing that he was doing the Dooley's Junkyard Dog that's an amazing thing amazing thing um Diedrich Frazier says that Oscar Delp is being severely overlooked I believe that's probably true and I think that some of that's actually even coming true from Georgia fans not because they don't like Delp of course they do but there's, I think this assumption that, you know, the drop off from no longer having Darnell Washington is going to be significant. Now, on the one hand, that isn't the case. On the other hand, while Delp may not be Darnell right now, I do think he has incredible value to Georgia. Hey, I think he can be a pass catching weapon. Um, but also, I think that Delp's a little bigger than some people give him credit for. Now, he's not as big as Darnell. Of course, no one is for the most part. But can Oscar be an effective blocker for Georgia in that two tight end set? I, th- I think he can be. I still think that Georgia probably plays the two tight end set a little more than some think that he will. They will. DT says, I saw James Brown at Music Midtown. 70 years old then, still the hardest working man in show business. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing where you, like, you come on stage with like the big you know coat, you sort of drop that off. I mean, like, true, great showman. Like a really, truly outstanding showman. Um Really very cool. Randy all predicting that uh, Georgia gets the running back from California, Nate Frazier, Bolden, and Chris Jones. So big predictions there from uh, Randy Hall, who always has a good time with stuff like that. Let me go to uh, Facebook here for a moment. See how the folks are doing over there. All right, on Facebook. Martin Goodman wondering if Nick, if uh, Glenn Schumann stays around until Nick Saban retires. I'll tell you this, Alabama could do a lot worse with its next head coach than Glenn Schumann. Now, it's weird. There's a part of my brain that would be super happy for Glenn Schumann if he got an opportunity like that because I think he deserves it. There's another part of me that does not want Glenn Schumann to be the coach at Alabama because uh, I think that would be a, you know, a good step in the right direction of the tide if they were to make that decision. So that creates a weird conflict to me, I guess. I'm sure a lot of Alabama fans may have felt the same way about Kirby Smart when he came to Georgia, I'm guessing. Um, uh, William Camacho wondering about the next target for Georgia. I think the K.J. Bolden is certainly on paper to possibly be the next. I would say there's also the chance of a surprise kind of popping up prior to that. But Bolden is the date we know there on August the 5th. Um Uh, Johnny Prescott giving you a shout out, uh, a, a, th- a throwback to Smoking the Bandit as he talks about some uh, Georgia recruiting stuff, which is pretty funny over here. Uh, let's see what else. Zach Adams believes that Oscar Delp is going to be a major piece for us. Excellent pass catcher. So Zach weighing in on behalf of Oscar Delp, and I like that. Um, let's see what else. Steve Chaffini says, the first time I saw James Brown, by the way, it's good to see Steve in here today, was on the was on the James Brown Celebrity Hot Tub Party. I don't know what that is, but that sounds pretty amazing. Uh, that sounds pretty amazing. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, you got some fun stuff going over here on Facebook. Uh, pretty funny, entertaining stuff. Uh, Suzanne Mai is asking about uh, Demarcus Riddick, currently a Georgia commit. There's been a large level of speculation that he might 
make a different decision. I believe he's choosing on Wednesday. I guess I'd favor Alabama on that, but admittedly I haven't followed that all that closely. I do know Alabama and Auburn are the two suitors here. I mean, I think it would be very interesting if Auburn could get that recruiting win, but I guess I sort of favor Alabama there. But I do think um, – I think it would be interesting if Auburn did win that one. Um, Becky Rutledge asking a question about the future of Devin Willick's jersey. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, uh, you know, how soon we see someone wearing number 77 again. I think that's interesting. Interesting question. Let me go to – let me go back across all the video platforms, get ready to wrap up here for today. Um, Jay Shipes also mentioned the Adam Anderson thing, which I guess maybe we should have mentioned that during the regular show, but he did accept a plea yesterday. You can read about this at dognation.com. Uh, you know, I'm not really the crime beat, so I'm not always you know, great in necessarily explaining some of this kind of stuff, but I guess by accepting a plea, he avoided the most serious charges there. Sounds like he's been in some, you know, trouble with the law since the uh, rape allegations that are out there for him. So you can read this. Obviously, to me, it's an incredibly sad story to see a life that for right now is turning out this way. And, you know, a lot of people have been impacted by this. Obviously, Anderson been impacted seemingly by his own choices. So I just wish him well in trying to figure some of that kind of stuff out. And then he can use this, you know, time, which is apparently going to be, you know, serving some time here you know sometimes you talk about you know rehabilitation rehabilitation paying debt to society that he can use that for the purpose i guess in which it's attended uh just really really sad to see the potential that he had kind of result in the current circumstances that he's in i think it's incredibly sad and obviously you know just a just a really really ugly situation but uh anderson did accept a plea deal you can get more details on that at uh, dognation.com um let's see what else uh, frederick meredith says oscar delp is plenty big enough to be a very effective blocker but again keeping loss and lucky off the field is going to be no easy chore i think that's exactly right i think by and large i'm going to bet on year two guys more so than year one guys just by and large and i could be wrong you know lucky may based on the spring chatter Maybe he does sort of jump the line here a bit. That's that's certainly a possibility. But, you know, I'm a little bit more interested in, like, say, Marvin Jones Jr. than I am Damon Wilson right now. I'm a little bit more interested in Oscar Delp than I am Lawson Lucky right now. I'm not going to get all of those bets right, but across the board, a slight favor for me on a year two guy compared to a year one guy, and we'll see how it kind of plays out. But that's kind of my slight bet. Um Uh, Scott Harris says, I respectfully disagree with your 64-team playoff comment. Basketball can do 64 teams because attrition is not as big an issue. A 64-team football playoff would kill less deep programs. So my point is, is I think by and large you're right, obviously, if you, which football would never do because football is not set up that way. But if you did have this 64-team tournament, less deep teams would wilt under that, but you would have more random occurrences. It's sort of like the World Series of Poker, you know, the larger you make the field, the more eventually you kind of punish the better overall players because, you know, you just you introduce more randomness into the situation. And there is a way in which you could theoretically expand the college ball playoff to the point where you brought randomness back into it. Whereas, you know, I think at a 12 team playoff, even maybe moving up to like a 16 team playoff, that to me is the optimum playoff size that really punishes the worst teams and promotes the better teams, which is ultimately probably what you want your postseason to do. You want your postseason to favor the better teams because the goal of a postseason is to reward the, the deserving champion. So that's probably what you want. And a smaller playoff you know, creates the opportunity for some randomness because you only got to win twice to win the national championship. And a larger playoff um, results in some randomness because – Let's say, theoretically, you had a 64-team college football tournament. That's 63 losses, right? If over the course of 63 losses, there will be some random upsets. And so, you know, uh, if number one seed gets knocked out, then all of a sudden now you've got the team who beat the number one seed playing somebody else, 
which only sort of creates more randomness because that's the way that the the larger tournaments kind of play out. It's like once you have one weird random result, all of a sudden now you've increased the likelihood of having other weird random results the rest of the tournament because the better overall teams have started to disappear a little bit. And, you know, that's just I think the overall point that I'm making is if I was the if I was the head coach of you know Louisiana Tech and I made a 64 team tournament would I would I have a chance of winning the tournament no I probably wouldn't that's just too many games for me to win but if you told me there were 63 teams are going to take a loss over the course of that 63 games would we see a weird team win a game or two we probably would and once you have some weirdness that creates the opportunity for more weirdness where you would have a little bit more of a random champion out of a 64-team tournament than you probably would out of a 16-team tournament or a 12-team tournament. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Frederick Meredith says, I'm convinced that we're not going to see nearly as much 12 personnel this year with uh, Bowers rarely leaving the field and only one uh, of Delp, Lucky, and Sperlin are, are going to play very much. Yeah, we'll see how uh, – I think it should be interesting. I think that should be interesting. Um, Army Dog Charlie, by the way, it's good to see him in the comment section, says, did I see that Nick Saban was talking about how high expectations can set you up for disappointment? I did see something about that from him, and obviously you can certainly read into that a lot of different ways, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I think you're right. Uh, it sort of seems like <laughs> there's a way of reading that. It almost seems like he's sort of setting uh, Alabama fans up to be let down easy. It kind of feels that way. Toby Trammell says the bigger bracket would be more opportunity for upsets. I, I think that's – I mean, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, in a 12-team playoff, you'll have 11 losses, and so one or two of those will also likely be an upset too. Just, you know, math would suggest – but the champion almost always will be a deserving champion. Um, all right, final comments on Facebook and DogNation.com are going to go. Steve Schiffini says, if a stingray can kill Steve Irwin, it can kill me with ease, which I think is probably true. You know, you go to, like, the aquariums and things like that, they always let you touch the stingrays. You do a little two-finger thing and sort of touch the stingrays. I always think it's weird that you can do that. I know they only sting on the tail, I guess. But to me, it's another one of those sea creatures that I feel like has been branded as this pet when it's called a stingray, right? I mean, uh, I mean, it's called a stingray. Like, it sort of feels like the name and its treatment within, like, culture are two very, very different things. A little bit of a dichotomy there, I believe. Um Peter Wilson says, thank you, B.A. Yeah, Peter, thank you, too. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and then some of y'all talking about Bears, too. Like, yeah, don't even you know get me started on some of this Bear stuff that's out there. Uh, I guess I guess the Black Bears are a, a little safer, right? That's the one where you can kind of scare off by being big. It's these people out in Montana. You always see these crazy videos coming out of Montana. First of all, I saw one, I think it was yesterday. I, I didn't know a buffalo could be this big. This buffalo was as big as a duplex. Huge, gigantic. But people are always, like those grizzly bears and stuff out there, that is no joke. That is no joke. Um, I mean, I feel like if you see a grizzly, it's probably over. It's probably over. Lucy Bowers Boykin says, I don't like being any, near any sea creature. I'm good with picking up seashells and stuff. Listen, if I see much more of these shark videos, I'm going to be right there with you. Um, back at dognation.com. A.J. Ferraro says, what would it take for Georgia to retire another jersey? Is winning the Heisman Trophy enough? They have said they're not going to retire any more jerseys. They, they do circle of honor now. Uh, so Georgia has said it's not going to retire any more jerseys, and I I think I take them seriously on that. Um, yeah, I, th- I think I take them seriously on that. Bill Russell says a grizzly is a land shark. It's a pretty good description. Um, Kevin Mill says with the possibility of thirty commits, is there a limit on how many can report early? I think that depends on how many guys Georgia has on campus because. 
you've still got 85 scholarship players, right? And you can only have 85 at any one given time. So your early enrollees, I guess, is determined by the number of players that you have on your roster at that point post-portal and uh, you know NFL draft declaration, things like that. So that is a noble number of the people inside the program. That is not a noble number for me, uh, you know, not being you know, necessarily a math whiz. But your early enrollees are not limited by any kind of recruiting rule, but they would be limited by the number of players you would have on campus at any one given moment. So, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, let's say you're Georgia, you got 85 scholarship players, you got, you know, 10 – what. Well, so I guess in most cases, once you factor in portal and kind of graduating seniors, you know, guys moving on the NFL, that's a big enough number that I guess it would not restrict your ability to have a really enrollees. But let's just say theoretically a small, right? It's like, you know, if you had – if you wanted all if you wanted all 30 guys to be early enrollees, just for the sake of conversation, if you wanted all 30 to be early enrollees – then you'd have to have at least 15 seniors leaving the program and 15, you know, draft picks leaving the pro, or, or, or I should say transfers leaving the program. You'd have you can only have 85 scholarship people on, you know, guys on campus at one time. I believe that's the case. Um, DT says when you go snorkeling, uh, he was in the Cayman Islands. He says Stingray kind of swam above him. And it blocked at the sun. It was the size of a Volkswagen. Yeah, I've seen some big rays before, too, when I've been snorkeling. Big rays. Now, it's really cool to see one when you're a long way away from it. If it's either way above you or kind of way below you, that's kind of a cool thing. A little bit of distance in the water is kind of cool. It's if you're in shallow water and you're going to swim over one kind of close, that's where it kind of gets a little bit, I guess, it's a little startling, I guess, maybe. Um, all right, we're going to go for now. Y'all, y'all appreciate you being here, part of our RS Andrews cool down. Y'all check out RS Andrews online for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. It's been hot. Good time to get that AC unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs. So find RS Andrews online to be able to do that at rsandrews.com. Have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.